Пожалуйста, Лерой Чао. Спасибо, Игорь Борисович. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure to be on this panel and an honor to be, a, a, again, a part of the International Space Medicine Summit. And it's just been a <clears throat> fascinating to, for me to listen in on the previous three decades as the uh, speakers have been talking about their experiences. During the first decade of uh, human spaceflight, I was a, a young boy growing up. And during the second and third, I was in school and then beginning my professional career. And Space Shuttle, of course, was being developed at that time and first flew in 1981. And so by the time we get to the fourth decade, which is when I was beginning my astronaut career, uh, Space Shuttle operations were mature and Space Shuttle was pretty much hitting its stride. And so to me, the fourth decade is the decade of Space Shuttle. It was really a, a heady time to be at NASA, to be starting a career at NASA. Uh, just a few years before President Bush 41 had announced the Space Exploration Initiative to go to Mars by the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. Uh, he, had per, he had asked Congress for a 24% increase in the NASA budget, and uh, the future was looking bright. You know, and we were all very excited to, to be starting our, our astronaut careers at NASA. Uh, unfortunately, as you all know, that didn't really pan out, and it was a disappointment as, as it became clear that even with a, uh, a presidential White House support, a budget director that was supportive, and uh, certain key members of Congress, we were unable to get that program going. But other, other great things came out of the uh, decade of the 1990s. Chiaki and I got to fly our first mission together on, on Space Shuttle Columbia. The... Um, we started, we started the evolving the troubled uh, Space Station Freedom Program into what it is today, the ISS program, and we began cooperation with the uh, Russian Space Agency, which was really a big deal when you consider that uh, the whole time I was growing up, the Soviet Union, uh, were, they were our Cold War enemies. And so it was really quite remarkable that I think shuttle and the space programs played a huge role in, uh, in being ambassadors and in, in international diplomacy. Uh, you know, both uh, both several Russian cosmonauts went on to fly on shuttle, including uh, Volodya Titov, who just spoke, and my, my good friend and crewmate, Salajan Sharipov, made his first flight on board shuttle. The um, International Space Station, as we evolved, was just being conceived, or evolving into that when Chiaki and I flew in 1994 for the first time, and it was a big deal that uh, uh, we were now going to be bringing in, in the Russians into the program. The, but, in, and arguably, building on their experience with Salyut and Mir and Phase 1 during the Shuttle Mir program, uh, I think it can be easily argued and accepted by everyone that Space Shuttle helped to prolong that program and, in fact, make it more robust in its final years. And I think also people would agree that space station, the space station that we have, could not have been built without space shuttle. Space shuttle wasn't designed to be the construction platform for space station, but it turned out to be the ideal construction platform. And I have to agree with Walt Cunningham, who earlier said that uh, uh, space shuttle is the most amazing flying flying machine that's ever been conceived of and built. I mean, nothing before or nothing even currently contemplated will even come close to its capability of carrying up to seven astronauts and fifty. 50,000 or so pounds of payload uh, into orbit, uh, transforming itself into an orbital platform to conduct research. Uh, my first mission was a space lab flight, and over the two-week period, Chiaki and I were part of a crew that conducted over 80 different investigations, working in two shifts around the clock. Uh, but it also is a superb uh, construction platform. It's got a robotic arm that is used to take pieces out, the payload out, so be it part of the space station or a satellite and attach it. You can do EVAs out of it. I performed four, uh, actually uh, four EVAs out of space shuttle airlocks and uh, was able to go out and help be part of the team to go and actually turn bolts, made electrical connectors and, and the like. So I think it's, uh, you know, as we move on to the next, uh, next decade that's going to talk here in a few minutes, uh, I think you'll see that Space Station continued uh, its role and, in fact, uh, uh, was key to building the ISS. But, but to me, the, de the fourth decade really was Space Shuttle's prime, this prime decade for Space Shuttle. Uh, as you all know, Space Shuttle is going to come to an end. The program will end in less than two months with the launch, final launch of Atlantis. And, uh, you know, about almost two years ago, I was part of the 
the uh, Augustine Committee, and we, uh, several of us, uh, tried like hell to figure out a way to save shuttle program because uh, this $3 billion that you're going to save, uh, anybody who's looked into it knows that really it's only $1.5 billion. The other one and a half goes to support things like the KSC, you know, the, the Kennedy Space Center is pretty much almost fully supported by space shuttle program, and so that one and a half is going to have to be absorbed by other other programs. So you're really only saving one and a half billion dollars a year by canceling the shuttle program. And we did come up with one option that would have kept shuttle flying at a low rate. And uh, we said that option makes sense if you're going to base your heavy lift vehicle on shuttle components. Uh, unfortunately, that was not part of the new space policy that was rolled out last year, so it looks like the shuttle will end. Now, ironically, everything we're hearing now about the direction of a heavy lift booster <coughs> is that it is going to be based on uh, shuttle components, but uh, there seems to be little political appetite and uh, financial appetite to try to save space shuttle now, so I think it's it's just going to uh, it's going to go away here soon. But. Uh, uh, as far as space medicine goes, uh, my, most of my experiences were in the fifth decade when I got to fly on the International Space Station, but certainly my first flights aboard shuttle uh, brought home to me the, the effects of zero gravity or microgravity and, and the environment on uh, the human body from personal experience. And, you know, I too trained as a, as a crew, uh, crew uh, uh, medical you know, representative, uh, but not until the space station era. So during shuttle time, I was just happy to uh, enjoy my relative youth and good health, and so I didn't really have too many medical concerns. But, uh, um, you know, space shuttle to me will always be uh, the vehicle. It was uh, certainly during the prime of my career, and, uh, you know, with that, I think I'll close. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Leroy. Слово предоставляется Смиту Джонсону. Thank you. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here, a real honor to be here, and uh, well done, Leroy, on your uh, synopsis of the, the 90s. The 90s were a real interesting time for me. I just got to JSC uh, in 1990. I worked at Wiley for three years and then became a NASA flight surgeon in 1994. And during that period, we had uh, the EDOMP, uh, STS-32 through 72. We had Shuttle Mir program. We had uh, the Hubble programs, STS-31. We had the Space Lab, Space Hab missions. Uh, and then we had the first element at the end of, of the 90s, go up in 1998. And we had a, a bunch of programs that didn't quite pan out, uh, such as the ACRV and Space Station Freedom got redesigned several times. So we, we had a lot of transitional programs going on. And we were trying to uh, work with our researchers to tackle the, uh, the EDOMP uh, EDO program was to tackle the pathophysiology behind our problems, which were orthostatic intolerance, neurovestibular, uh, adaptation problems, musculoskeletal metabolic problems, and radiation exposures. We also had pathophysiology and how we worked as a team as far as the crews, the flight surgeons, the uh, operational researchers, and the, uh, the basic researchers that were more aligned with headquarters. And we tried to integrate those so that we could work better, and we started integrated product teams, which is something I'll talk about later that's something I think we, we need to do in the future. And um, you know, we worked very hard to earn the trust of, of the astronauts, but sometimes that put us in a, in a position that didn't align us with the researchers. So we had, to, we had to work that, and simply by sitting down and talking, which is an amazingly simple concept that uh, we don't do sometimes. Uh, with our teams, we were able to come up with some, some good countermeasures and some good flight rules. Uh, I think EDOMP had 125 formal publications and almost 300 abstracts produced, but we really produced results. We developed a, a better treadmill, a cycle ergometer, a rower. We came up with uh, isotonic fluid loading protocols. Uh, we got a CTV, thanks to Dr. Poole and Dr. Sawin, to uh, help us with our egress training. That was STS-32 was actually the first time uh, an IV was started uh, in the orbiter. Uh, to help a crew member. Now we usually on landing we have one or two or three IVs set up because they know they're going to feel better. Even if they're feeling okay, they just want to go ahead and get a, a liter and a half or two of fluids. Uh, we developed liquid cooling garments. We developed procedures to cold soak the cabin. Uh, we did LBMP research and found that it helped, but operationally it just wasn't worth it 
to us on the, on the shuttle at that time for a countermeasure. Um, we did orbital egress testing with, uh, we had a treadmill on the CTV where we actually had people full up in their G suits trying to, trying to egress at full tilt if they had to run from the orbiter. And we found that carbon dioxide was a limiting factor. We had rules of how to open your visor if you were going and how to take out, decrease your G suit uh, uh, clicks uh, to help you uh, ambulate out. And we heard a couple people doing those tests. So we, we learned from that. We also learned uh, that there were some electrolyte metabolism problems and, with, and we increased our fluids and our nutrition. We also environmentally developed a combustion products analyzer to monitor our organic compounds. We then had the Hubble program, first started STS-31, where we pushed the envelope on some radiation exposures, but we really pushed the envelope on EVAs. And we hurt some folks, and I'll talk about that a little later, and that may be addressed in, in the later decades. We then had the Shuttle Mir program, and we had seven flights, and we had, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we had uh, two cultures. Um, not only the culture of, of our, our Russian colleagues and our culture, but we also had the culture in the astronaut corps that, you know, this is the shuttle program. What, what are you guys doing going off doing long-duration flight? You know, the, the transition from uh, a shuttle mission, which is a 16-day mission, 17 at most, to now a long duration mission, um, took some real interesting uh, uh, behavioral health and psych hits on our families and our crews who were going over to Russia to train for these missions. And my kudos uh, go out to our, uh, our psych and behavioral health and support teams for all the work they did with the families and crews and our flight surgeons who really, I, I never did one of the, the mirror missions, but I, my hat's off to people like Mike Barrett and Dave Ward who went out there and, and, uh, and, and spent a tremendous amount of time supporting our crews uh, in, in Moscow and, and, uh, and Baikonur and throughout the training there. We learned a great deal from our, our Russian colleagues. They were used to being in space for long periods of time. We were used to sending a lot of people up, but they, they had spent a lot of time. I think they had five or six space stations uh, before Mir. So the other thing we worked with them on was telemedicine and working with our international partners uh, to actually telecommunicate. I and mean, we have mission controls throughout the world, and, and that's a very uh, important uh, thing that we've done. Um, uh, the next mission I'd like to mention is STS-90. I'm sure Chiaki will have words about that, and that's Neurolab, and that was my first long-duration sort of uh, space lab mission where I was the crew surgeon and ended up working with a crew for about, excuse me, for about <clears throat> three years. And you really get to know your crews quite well. And uh, I'll come back to that, but I, I want to talk about long duration and, and these types of missions as, as crews and our international partnership is, is sort of being family. Very quickly, concerning uh, lessons learned, crew health and medical emergencies, these are some of the things that happened uh, in this decade for all our programs. We had thermal injuries, we had toxic ingestions, we had dental problems, we had urologic problems, we had depression, we had skin rashes that required uh, uh, multiple therapies. We diagnosed Parkinson's disease and flew a person with Parkinson's disease who did a, a spacewalk. We had corneal abrasions. We had some really close calls and in flight instances of coronary disease, for which now I think uh, our medical standards and our screening techniques have really uh, pushed the envelope out there and have some applications um, for, for uh, terrestrial medicine also. We've actually found uh, uh, some astronauts with early coronary disease. And now the, the hope is through working with some of the best uh, experts, both, both cardiovascular and nutritionally, that we can now actually stop and reverse coronary disease uh, by using techniques and we are going to try to fly someone that we are hoping that we are reversing their disease. And finally, orthopedic injuries. A, a huge number of orthopedic injuries, uh, especially after we hit the wall to build this space station. Uh, and if we hit the wall to build a lunar base or a Mars base, that will also increase. The, the lesson learned there is our Russian colleagues are very good at human factors. Build the suit around the person, not the person to the suit. 
We've also had a problem with herniated discs, nuclear pulposis on landings. Interestingly enough, it's been more on our short duration flyers than our long duration flyers. And, the, and it's been within the first year, six months to year after returning. And the reason for that is probably that we take such good care of our long duration flyers because they're debilitated and we have one-on-one -on -one ACERs or rehab people and, and flight surgeons with them. Whereas our, inter, our short duration flyers come back and we see them at R plus three and we say whether they can drive or, or, or whether they can fly a jet. And we, we probably don't, had, have not done a, a good enough job in keeping them slowed down. Some of our posture platform tests uh, have been a more sensitive measure uh, to, to, to show the people, to show our crews that it's, you're not back to normal yet. Do not go drive on the interstate. Do not go rollerblade or go running quite yet. <clears throat> so that's something to work on. And finally, sorry, I like to say that some things never change, uh, uh, especially on the, the comment on the Johnny Walker. I used my NASA credit card, which I got in 1996. My first purchase was vermouth and gin for my crew, the dog crew, returning uh, from a mission. Um, and finally, I'd like to, to, to say uh, a few suggestions. Working on Neurolab, I also worked on Columbia. Um, you, you become not only the physician, uh, and the behavioral health support for your for your crews and your families, you end up doing that for life. And I think one of the things we're we're really missing the boat on, and we've we've made strides with our longitudinal uh, uh, astronaut health surveillance program, and we're we're trying to beef that up. But we're an occupational model, and our astronauts, our crews, have had occupational exposures, and then to have them retire and leave NASA, and we give them the ability to come back on a yearly basis. We need to be stronger on getting these folks back and doing more comprehensive tests. Unfortunately, we've lost a few people uh, because they haven't, we, they haven't followed up with, uh, with some proper testing. And I think that's something we really need to work on. I also think that it's not just about our crews, it's about our support personnel. It's about our 24 seven ops, our mission controllers uh, that we're burning out. And as far as I know, I have never been busier in my career. Maybe it's because I'm getting older. But uh, I'm okay when the shuttle goes away uh, because we've got six people on orbit 24-7 with a bunch of, uh, I mean, we need something else, obviously. But uh, it's, it's really busy up there. And the crews, the station is so incredible. And the training, the pre-flight training is tougher than probably the training uh, the, than being up in space. So... Uh, I'd like to say that we need to, to work on our ground personnel and our crews uh, and approach it from a multidisciplinary approach, which we, I learned on Neurolab in Columbia, that you sit down with your researchers, your crews, your planners, your schedulers, and you, and you work together as a team, uh, as we've done on a fatigue management team internationally with all our international partners that uh, will hopefully help... Uh, not only our crews, but our ground control teams, and also have spinoffs for the rest of, uh, of, of our countries. And that's, that's enough. Спасибо, Смит, за Thank you, Smith, for such a beautiful uh, clinical, space clinical uh, information. You provided very interesting data. Thank you. Uh, Mukai. Oh, yeah, thank you. The good morning. I'm Chiaki Mukai from Japanese Space Agency. And since Leroy and Smith has already uh, talked quite a lot during this decade, I would like to talk about the three things from the international, view, international uh, the participants' viewpoint. So the, the three things is accomplishment, the lessons learned, and also the international <coughs> collaboration. So the first thing is accomplishment. If I recall the each uh, the think back the each decades and then uh, what I understand is 1960s is a golden year or golden age of manned space flight, and 1970s is the, uh, the uh, Joe Cowen mentioned that uh, uh, the, the Skylab verified human can perform activities including science in space, which means we are not 
only survive in space, but we actually work in space. That was 1970s, we verified. In the 1980s, thanks to the space shuttle uh, the, the program, the shuttling uh, between the low Earth orbit and also the Earth can be realized, and the massive transportation, uh, including the variety of people, and specializing the work, uh, specializing the role of the astronaut, cosmo uh, astronaut in space. So the 1990s, when I worked, I can say I was so privileged to work in this time because I can say that the 1990s is the golden age of space utilization. So my first flight was Leroy, and I flew uh, international microgravity the second. But the 1990s, we had so many space laboratory uh, the missions uh, scheduled. And I flew only two times, but actually I, assi I was assigned two other missions as a backup. So continuously, uh, the 1990s, I worked uh, for some space laboratory type of mission like a Space Lab J, it was a, by the way, it's a bilateral uh, missions between Japan and the, uh, the USA, and then I was a uh, backup. And the, nine, the IML-2, this was the, uh, the one that I flew as a prime. And then the IML-2, uh, we had a lot of experiments, including the physiological, the life science experiment, and to me, uh, the, the, during this uh, space laboratory, the, mission, the time, including 1980s Space Lab 1 and 2, we are trying to focus more uh, mechanisms behind some adverse effect uh, of the space uh, environment to the human body. Like a space medicine, sometimes it's uh, more like uh, operational medicine. So, but uh, if we combine some physiology or basic science, including the model animals using the space laboratory, we would like to expand the research, not only the uh, not only to observe the phenomena, but also to understand the mechanisms behind. So that was the one that the space, quite a lot of space laboratory type of mission uh, 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 conducted. And then the, uh, the Neurolab mission, SS-90, uh, that was, I, I, I worked as a backup crew for the Neurolab. But the Neurolab mission is one of the, to me, the most uh, sophisticated and the most the well-organized missions with a uh, lot of challenges. Like, uh, for example, we conducted a micro with the combination of the lower body negative pressure and also the catecholamine uh, the uptakes, uh, the research. So those techniques is a very difficult, kind of very difficult and a lot of uh, the people's involvement necessary technique, even if we do this on ground, but we did it. This type of uh, the situ uh, the situation, uh, this type of the experiment, the very sophisticated experiment on board the uh, the Neurolab mission. So, the, the during this Neurolab mission and also the IML2 mission, uh, IML2 the second the mission, I think uh, the medical operation is very closely uh, combined or support uh, supported the. Uh, physiological experiment on board. So we had a very good relationship with flight surgeons to support, the, to support this kind of uh, the intensive medical type and physiological type experiment. So that was the, the Neurolab. And the STS-95, uh, I flew with Senator John Glenn. And Senator John Glenn made this uh, flight so famous and this 95 was specialized for understanding the relationship of space physiology and gerontology. Because some, the pathology may be different, but the symptomatic wise, the something happening on the astronaut cosmonaut in the physiology wise, it is very similar to the, uh, the physiology, uh, the, something happening, the symptom wise, uh, happening in the uh, senior 
uh, the elderly people. So that uh, this mission was specialized to understand those uh, connections. So to me, I can say two things. The one thing, Senator John Glenn was wonderful and very, very elaborated person, but not only his effort, <laughs> but also to me, the accumulative uh, achievement of the medical, uh, uh, medical, uh, medical achievement uh, uh, before actually helped him to fly into space. Like, for example, 77 year, he was 77 years old at that time. So without having the extensive and accumulative uh, information uh, the, from both Russian or American side, I don't think that the NASA decided to uh, send him into space, even if it's only 10 days, because it's a new challenge and pushed the em uh, envelope for the, uh, the elderly people who are healthy enough can fly into space for a short time. So this also opened up the possibility for the, uh, the people in future to, try, uh, to uh, fly into space as a space tourist. So I think it's just a kind of uh, the medical accomplishment for the SS-95. The other, um, other medical kind of uh, the accomplishment is uh, during this the late, 90, late 90s, we frequently start using the catchphrase about <laughs> space medicine for people on Earth. So, so far, the space medicine was a survival medicine and then helps for the astronaut and the cosmonaut who are outside of the, out of the world. But now, the, uh, the, thanks to the accumulation of that uh, the space medicine, uh, the information, the space medicine technology and the, the knowledge can used for the people who are living on Earth. Uh, the good example was the Chilean, uh, the, the NASA helped the Chilean situation. So that's also the one that the space medicine becomes to reach that maturity. So that, so that's, that, that I think, the, 19, uh, the late 1990s, we are trying to understand the space, uh, the use the space medicine for the people on the Earth. So that's the accomplishments. And then the briefly, I would like to talk about the lesson a lesson to learn is a positive way. And then the one thing that I would like to say is a payload specialist program. Because I worked as a payload, uh, the four missions as a payload specialist, and the two backup, two prime. And I really appreciate this program because uh, uh, Jeff Hoffman mentioned that the 1980s, the, thanks to the space shuttle, variety of people, including the payload specialists, can fly into space, which means space becomes the actual place for people to work, not to only survive. So uh, the thanks to this payload specialist program, we can bring so many different uh, the type of people into space to work together like we do on Earth. So this was very uh, good, and at that time, uh, primary kind of resources in, uh, in, the, in, in, in the space shuttle program was used for the payload activities, so that the, we had a lot, uh, the, the plenty of resources, including crew time, and for example, IML-2, like Leroy mentioned, we had a 24 hours operation, two shift operation. So the laboratory was in full use. So uh, I really miss that kind of the type at that, at that time that we had uh, plenty of resources for utilizing the payload. So uh, the hope that uh, currently the International Space Station uh, we have six people, but uh, have not, to me, specialized the activities, uh, the roles of the, uh, the, uh, the crew yet, crew members yet. So hopefully that when the International Space Station becomes the more much at a mature stage for the utilization, I really would like to see more different type of people working together in space. Although I understand fully that the International Space Station requires intensive maintenance, 
compared to the space shuttle program, because the space shuttle is only one time flight, like two, two weeks, so that uh, maintenance will be, most of the maintenance will be done on the ground. So it's a little bit different, but uh, hopefully, uh, like a Space Dragon X or something like that, if we can bring more people into space, more access to space, then the space, uh, the space or the International Space Station truly will become the place for people to work. So that is the lessons and the land. And then the, finally, the international collaboration. So as I, believe, uh, the, as, uh, as I mentioned in 1990s, we had a lot of space laboratory type of missions. And then we started the bilateral collaborations. Like for example, Space Lab J is the collaboration between Japan and uh, United States. And then the international microgravity is the second, which Leroy and I flew. It says international, micro, international, but it's the combination of bilateral collaboration. Like Japan collaborated with NASA, NASA collaborated with ESA, and then the, uh, the CSA or something like that. So it's, 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 it's like a combination of a bunch of bilateral type of collaboration, like JAXA versus ESA, etc. And then the Neurolab becomes a truly multilateral collaboration. Like we, when we do currently, like international AO, like a Neurolab mission, the each agency just put some devices which can be used in space and then ask the international uh, participant to develop some experiment protocols. So that is the kind of uh, the, uh, the beginning stage to become the International Space Station's multilateral something, like a MMOP, like multilateral medical operation panel. The recently we have M, uh, the multi M corp, M mop, M something. So that is just a, now, now it, we have become the truly multilateral collaboration. So, uh, but it, it's not only, uh, the, that is the country-wise collaboration, nation-wise collaboration, but also I would like to add one more thing, organization, organize, organizational, organization-wise collaboration. Because uh, STS-95, which I worked, that flew 1998, was the uh, the collaboration with the space hub. So it was the introduction of the commercialized use of the space. So now I think we have even more collaboration with organizational, uh, organizational collaboration, not only the commercialization, and then the, in future we will have the space tourism. And also, again, uh, this kind of organization, including more people, into the space program, not only the professional astronauts, professional engineers, professional doctors, but also the outside of the, uh, the space program to the people uh, living in the outside needs to be included in the space. So to me, in future, the, ninth, the later, the ninth, the, the, since we have accomplished the wonderful ninth, uh, the 50 years of human space flight, so for the future, I think the space, uh, space program or space accomplishment needs to be utilized for the humanity, uh, which are not included currently in our society. That's what I think. But the medical, the medical accomplishment actually the, did such a wonderful uh, job. That's the reason why now we can think of the space program for humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, such a great uh, summary statement and uh, you know, for your endeavor into fundamental science as well. Thank you so very much. We have 45 minutes remaining. And so let's say 10 minutes each, 8 to 10 minutes each for each presenter, and then we'll have a little bit of time remaining for uh, 
whatever uh, go backs because we've probably uh, missed out on something because at the pace we've been going at we uh, more likely have missed something справедливое замечание мы так и сделаем Comment from the audience uh, uh, to speak more on the, uh, on the contribution you. of the and, uh, Mir station. Thank you for uh, uh, inviting me here. It's very exciting and a lot of uh, prominent people. And um, to me, uh, the last decade, the fifth decade, the last 10 years is definitely the decade of the assembly of the International Space Station. Uh, I won't call it the decade of the International Space Station because uh, I, we know we'll use it at least for another decade. And uh, I hope it will then uh, be the real decade of the International Space Station. I also think that these last 10 years has been a decade of real international cooperation uh, of humans in space. Of course, there's been a lot of international cooperation in human spaceflight uh, since uh, mid-70s, I guess, with the Apollo S uh, Soyuz program first. But uh, now we really have it working in space. And to some extent might be seen here by the panel right now. We are four people from four different uh, countries, four different space agencies. And uh, for Europe, uh, this last decade has been uh, the decade where we finally really, I think, get into human space flight. We finally have our own uh, real estate in space permanently. The Columbus Laboratory, which uh, docked the space station in February 2008, with two European astronauts uh, participating, and uh, with our uh, automatic transfer vehicle, which is uh, regularly bringing uh, logistics and our uh, support to the space station, uh, I think we feel we are uh, a little bit more player in the game than since um, roughly late 80s when Europeans have been flying occasionally uh, with uh, Russians and, uh, and Americans. And uh, this is something, of course, we are proud of. I still think, though, that in Europe we lack uh, a lot of political support to the same extent as uh, you have in America and uh, you have in Russia. I mean, I'm sure here in, you don't think you have enough uh, support <laughs> from, uh, to NASA. But if you compare uh, money per person, which you get, it's, uh, to human spaceflight is probably a factor of five to ten more than we get in Europe, and that's something we Europeans definitely need to work on. Uh, and uh, I think the biggest problem for future flights is um, not really the medical problems, it's not even the technological problem, it's the political problem. How do we uh, build the support which we need from society and the policy? So therefore I think it's very appropriate that this summit is kind of holding here in the policy institute. But um, to come back uh, to this uh, decade we are uh, talking uh, about, uh, uh, I was uh, fortunate to be um, very present in the very f beginning of it, which started kind of, I would say, then two months before 2001. It, uh, first of November, ISS was first permanent manned by the uh, one-hour flight, and uh, in this international cooperation spirit, I, as a non-American, was actually the NASA astronaut office representative at SUP during that flight, which was very exciting uh, for me also. And um, then I got the opportunity to fly twice myself to uh, ISS, first time in 2006, and I was really halfway of assembling ISS. At least our flight director for that flight, uh, 12.8.1, he claimed that with the little piece we put on there, P5, uh, we just passed halfway on mass on assembly ISS. But that's probably not true anymore because ISS now is big and it was foreseen to be at that time. And I'm sure ISS never been really will be complete. Like any house, it will always change and add and uh, fix things. Uh, one thing which uh, struck me was uh, Drew Corwin mentioned that uh, the solar array problem, which was fixed in EVA. And we had the same, pro same thing during our flight there, a solar array problem, and uh, it needed an EVA to fix it, and was unscheduled, 
and uh, it went very successful. And I think that is one thing that's been shown over, particularly maybe uh, ISS assembly time, that how much we have learned in doing EVAs and prepare, preparing EVA and how well it can be executed with the help from ground. And uh, that's uh, one of maybe the big things with the ISS assembly, all these EVAs. Two and a half years later, in uh, September 2009, I made my second uh, and final flight to ISS, and then it was already more or less complete. All the solar arrays were in place, and it was a wonder to see it. It was also an amazing feeling to work there on board. We were 13 people from five different countries. Uh, when we arrived, it was a Russian commander, and later was to switch over to European commander, Frank de Wien from Belgium. And uh, that really gave international spirit and uh, the, the kind of teamwork feeling you had up there was very nice. And uh, I hope that uh, we can enlarge this. I mean, we have now some about 15 countries participating in ISS, but obviously all these flags, I think I counted them to 29. I hope we will have all those flags on our next big endeavor, uh, which should be, of course, be Mars. But personally, I believe that we need to go back to the moon first to learn a lot of things. Uh, so that's definitely something I'm looking forward to. It was with mixed feelings. Uh, I left ISS uh, because uh, I had such a good time there, although it was only a little bit over a week. Uh, knowing that beautiful station, seeing flying around it, see the floating over Earth, and knowing that unfortunately I will never get back there because my bosses had already told me this will be the last flight. Uh, but I was very happy uh, knowing that this station is there, been part of building it, and it will be used now for all of humanity to do a lot of unique science which cannot be done on ground. Among them, of course, how to learn how the human bodies uh, experience uh, weightlessness, and how we then can learn to eventually go further in space. And uh, I'm happy now that I come back. I'm working with the science which uh, is being done there. I'm uh, responsible, for, let's say, organizing the ESA science program for ISS and related. And one thing which I at least uh, think during the last decade we have learned in, uh, IS in Europe is that to do the best out of the science on ISS, we need to embed it in a lot of science on ground. And in the medical field, we uh, then have, for example, organized, uh, more organized program of better studies and other things. Another um, uh, program we're taking part in is, is the Mars 500 that IBMP by Ushakov in a very successful way. We had two uh, ESA astronauts, uh, not ESA astronauts, but ESA participants in the crew of six. And one thing which uh, is not really related to exactly what they're doing, but to me shows the fascination in the public is that the PR interest on this 520-day isolation study where they're simulating a complete mission to Mars and back is enormous. Uh, when they, so to say, landed on Mars and uh, took a uh, uh, press conference, and I think I did more interviews then than I had done during my own flights. And it shows the fascination in my mind the public has in this idea that the one day can get to Mars. And you just need to learn how to catch on that and use it to, to formulate the program which we want to do. So. Um, just want to finish up with a few words on, on medicine. I'm uh, not medical background, but one thing which uh, was all, almost surprising was that when I got, came to space the first time, there was no real su surprise medically. Uh, and I think that speaks to how well over the previous decades uh, you, all, you all have learned how the body works and how well good the training and everything is to convey this information to the astronauts that you really know what to expect and no, no big surprise. Now, there still are surprises in, in uh, science, I think, and uh, one thing which recently has been uh, realized that there might be a problem with some intracranial high pressure which might create some uh, vision problems for people who have been in space. And uh, so that took 50 years maybe to, to uh, 
realize, hey, we may have a new problem here. So we need to continue doing the research. My own little research has more, rather been in radiation, uh, and radiation is false under life sciences, but uh, coming from physics, I don't really know the details how it uh, affects it. But I do have learned uh, through some own uh, research that I think it will be in practice impossible to create a shield system which will shield us against galactic uh, high energy, heavy ions. So uh, I believe the way which we have to go and go to Mars will have to be with the new propulsion system, which is, will take us there in more weeks rather than months. And, and uh, that is maybe the highest challenge to develop these uh, technical um, propulsion systems. Okay, I'm diverging to the future, but I guess that's the privilege you have when you're in the last decade here. Uh, so uh, before I expire my time too much, uh, I'll just play. Thanks again, and uh, looking forward to flying future. Thank you for such an emotional, beautiful present presentation. Uh, uh, we have uh, Michael Lopez Alegre. Uh, thank you. Спасибо. Good morning, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> it's a privilege for me to be up here on this panel. I, I think uh, I look at the list of invitees and speakers at this event uh, every year, and every year I think they've outdone themselves, and, and this year is no different, Mr. Abbey. So congratulations on a, a really fine program that you've put together. Um, and it's also a pleasure to be here with so many colleagues at this table. I've uh, flown with uh, two of the people and just missed the third one. So. Uh, it's it's an interesting forum to be able to exchange ideas with uh, people, you know, both from uh, our little knothole as crew members and then the, the greater medical community at large. Uh, you'd think that in 10 years there'd be a lot to talk about. Um, Christopher hit on a lot of the points that I was going to bring up, and <clears throat> I would uh, I would like to underline or, or underscore um, one of the things that he said, and that is that um, or maybe disagree with them slightly. I do think that the 2000 was a year of the ISS, at least, or the decade of the ISS, at least the first decade. Um, we really saw a huge transition from uh, the fledgling space station that uh, Koichi and Leroy and I visited uh, at the end of 2000, which was unmanned and had a grand total of three elements to it, um, to the way it is when uh, at the end of 2010. Um, I flew just about in the middle of the decade, a little bit after the middle. We saw uh, an evolution from uh, three crew members at the beginning of it. We went down to two after the Columbia accident and resumed operations at three in July of 2006, just before I got there. And I grossly talk about my time on board as uh, basically being about one-third dedicated to um, ops, basically maintenance, uh, one-third to construction and one third to science. I think if you look, if I looked a little bit more closely, that would be probably a big exaggeration, the third to science, uh, unfortunately. And uh, that is very uh, important today as we struggle mightily to find enough crew time to be able to conduct experiments that we're doing. I think we have a mandate to try to fly 35 hours a week, and that's divided among uh, six. Uh, crew members. So you think that's not very much, but we are really having a hard time doing that with all the vehicle traffic that's coming and going from the station. And um, <clears throat> so my third estimate was probably a, a little bit generous. And um, I know Julie Robinson is here. She's the ISS uh, program scientist, and she's working hard with the operations community to try to, to reduce some of the operational overhead that we find that we're doing and make those hours be available. Uh, but it's a real challenge. Uh, certainly one of the highlights of the International Space Station is the international aspect, which Christopher also mentioned. Um, I'd like to just take a, a moment to mention what I think are a couple success stories and, and then maybe one where we could um, use some improvement. Um, the, the success story, the first one I'd like to talk about is in the operational world we have an International Space Station mission management team. We get together uh, twice a week, uh, unless there's a shuttle docked, as there is now, and we, uh, w when we meet daily. Um, the forum includes representation, of course, from all of the uh, international partners, as well as the technical disciplines um, within NASA and elsewhere. And we have had to s tackle some pretty thorny issues. Uh, sometimes, whenever you have a consensus um, arrangement, 
uh, and I'm often reminded of the situation of the governments in Europe that uh, are in the European Union, uh, it's natural for people to have disparate interests. You know, everybody wants to do the best thing for their particular country or, or partner, uh, yet we're also, also trying to serve the common good. Um, and we've managed to work through those. Uh, a lot of backroom haggling goes on ahead of time, but when we come to the uh, IMMT, uh, I can say with some optimism that we're pretty uh, consensual and, and we end up getting things done. This morning, for example, we met and discussed the um, likelihood now that we're going to have the Soyuz crew that's going to be undocking on the 23rd actually perform uh, some photography, which is requires a completely different change of operations. They're going to have to station keep, um, egg, enter into the habitation compartment, take some video and photos while the station does sort of a pirouette maneuver in front of it. And you may think, is all that stuff worth, worth the risk? And I think the point is that <clears throat> as not only as a nation, but as an international uh, operations community, we rely on government funding to execute our programs. And that government funding in, terms, in turn depends on public interest. And all of the esoteric things that many of you scientists know in this room, it's very difficult to share that with the public at large. And therefore, they're very difficult to motivate their interest in, in, in um, ISS or human space flight in general. But a picture is worth a thousand words, as they say, and probably a video is worth a million words. So if we can get some nice high-definition uh, video of the space station, particularly with the shuttle docked to it, um, the leverage that that has is worth the, the effort that the, that the teams uh, all culminating in the IMMT are, are performing. Uh, second, perhaps less uh, glorious uh, example would be the MCOP, the Multilateral Crew Operations Panel. Uh, the, the different partners have different, uh, let's say, rights to fly their crew members on board the space station. And uh, you, believe it or not, it's a fairly complicated formula that, that determines all that. Again, this board meets frequently um, by telecon and twice a year face-to-face. -face, so we decide which crew member will fly in, in which uh, allocation. We have to look at their professional technical background. Uh, we get a head nod from the medical community to make sure that um, they're qualified for flight, and then they begin their two and a half years of training. An area that I think could use some improvement, and this was brought out at the last uh, at last year's summit, was perhaps the um, international joint research piece, and specifically the medicine piece. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, at the beginning of this, um, I'll say, period where we're concerned about intracranial pressure or uh, visual, uh, let's say vision um, perturbations based on long duration spaceflight, we had seen uh, on the U.S. side, we'd seen a couple people land with uh, swelling um, in the back of the eye and um, cotton wool spots, which are manifestations, and I'm, I'm quickly getting out of my depth in the medical term, but I, at, having been one of these guys, I know exactly what was going on, to me anyway. And uh, this was of some concern, and we ran off and did some tests. Um, I, I was the first person that had it, and uh, at, only at that point, apparently there was some communication with uh, the Russian side, and the, and the Russians said, oh, yeah, we see that all the time. So, and I'm paraphrasing here, and I apologize if I'm uh, insulting anybody's serious research that's going on here, but uh, my point is that I think that there's a great wealth of knowledge, particularly concerning long-duration flight on the side of the Russian medical community, less so on the U.S. side, and it would be good if we shared those results and proposed perhaps further research um, to try to indicate you know, where we could better use the time that we're, the limited time that we do have on orbit to follow up on that. Um, I will say on the positive side of that research uh, slash operational medicine, we seem to be doing a really good job at, uh, at countermeasures, exercise countermeasures. So the addition of the second treadmill on board uh, and especially the advanced resistive exercise device seem to be huge success stories that all the crew members rave about, not from, not just from a feeling better, and psychologically better uh, standpoint, but the bone loss data apparently are, are bearing out that they're um, very positive. Um, 
I guess the, the last thing I'll talk about is the, uh, Christopher mentioned briefly the, the analog study um, that's going on in Russia right now. Um, when we started back in the beginning of the, the really the uh, end of the shuttle Mir program when we were flying our long duration guys on there, we, we quickly realized that being prepared from a behavioral health psychological standpoint for a two-week mission has nothing to do with what it would be like for a three or now six-month mission. So we quickly scrambled to figure out how can we better prepare our guys to do that. <clears throat> and we came up with a sort of syllabus, and it's evolved quite a bit. Um, in the beginning, the syllabus was one of the astronauts doing a bunch of research and putting together a, uh, a seminar, a two-day seminar on, on expedition behavior, as we called it. And uh, that then became uh, some field exercises. And as far as I can tell, the point of these field exercises was to make everybody as miserable as possible because if the theory is when you're miserable, you're more snappy and therefore you'll get some of these um, undesirable behaviors out in the open. And we've actually used results of some of these things to select out people from long duration space flight. Um, we've got a lot smarter now, and we've signed on with a group <clears throat> called the National Outdoor Leadership School that uh, runs about two-week courses in several, several different modalities. Uh, they include uh, cross-country hiking, cross-country skiing, um, canoeing, sailing, and uh, ocean kayaking. And so th this has morphed from a sort of an endurance test survival school thing almost to a real learning environment. So you, you, there is definitely a mission and there is uh, a team set up and they stress the, the three sort of tenets of what we call expedition behavior, which are self-care, self-management, leadership and followership, and finally teamwork. And so every once in a while in this two-week period um, in the field, the team will take a break and you'll actually have with instructors a sit-down uh, course about, you know, what theoretically, what are we learning out here and practically how does the experience that we just had yesterday apply to the theory that um, the books say we should learn. I was somewhat skeptical that that would be effective and especially from a leadership perspective. Coming from a military background, I, I kind of thought that leadership is something that you, you just gain through experience, but I have to say that it was very enlightening to go through some of these courses and, and learn um, you know, from the standpoint of academia with practical hands-on application, how uh, you might become a better leader, a better follower, basically a better expedition crew member. And finally, the uh, sort of the graduate exercise now is something called NEMO, the NASA, NASA Extreme Environment Missions Operations, um, which is a contrived acronym for sure to talk about a, uh, an underwater habitat um, experience uh, off the coast of Key Largo. So you're in about 50 or 60 feet of water. You're in there from anywhere from seven, I think up to 30 days. And you're in saturation, meaning that you can't just uh, get claustrophobic and decide you, you want to go get a, a hamburger. You have to stay um, in the habitat or underwater if you're out doing an EVA. Uh, that has really changed a lot. Um, I participated in the very first one, uh, which was basically just a uh, uh, proof of concept idea where we did some, we call them EVAs also, because um, they are extravehicular, but these scuba dives that um, will last for a couple hours at a time, <clears throat> some night dives, testing the habitat um, to a full blown now analog where we have a mission control topside that has a plan of the day. We use a lot of the same uh, planning and operational tools that we have aboard ISS. We have specific objectives that are actually now developmental objectives. This one coming up in October is going to uh, explore techniques for how you might do uh, an EVA or uh, attach your, a vehicle to an asteroid, so a very low gravity uh, object. So my point is that we've learned a lot in learning a lot about um, expedition behavior. Um, so in closing, again, I, I think the decade has been very interesting from the, its evolutionary standpoint, both from the, what the ISS was to what it's become, um, and specifically how these analogs, how we've learned from uh, the very initial days and uh, taking a page from our uh, Russian colleagues' playbook, how we can learn to be better expedition crew members. Thank you.
спасибо за интересное выступление. Thank you. This is a very interesting presentation. We have very little time left, and I propose that uh, Mike discusses along with us the problems of new risk types. On panel number one at 1330, we can continue uh, such a discussion, especially because we're discussing it at length within the framework of the Russian and American Working Group. And it's uh, not everything is simple there. So we have about 20 minutes, and I'm asking you to fit your presentation in about five to seven minutes, especially because because uh, Salazar Sharipov. I will be brief. Dear friends, uh, we're talking about the space flight experiences here, and it's understandable that uh, Michael was talking about not what used to be, but what we have for today, what we see, what we observe, what everybody who is sitting here is doing or will be doing. And uh, Chris was correct when he said that um, that it hasn't nothing is finished yet, it's only a beginning, because the International Space station uh, is just uh, almost over uh, being constructed, assembled, and, and it has turned into a huge scientific laboratory where you can conduct a huge number of experiments. Uh, and again, as Michael mentioned, unfortunately, there is a few, there are few, too few experiments being conducted. But uh, it's a matter of the nearest future, and all the achievements, accomplishments that have been reached uh, during the previous years are a result of the fact that we have been working together and that we've been flying together and we cooperate. And I thought about myself, I, I thought quietly to myself that even 20 or 30 years ago, I couldn't even imagine that I could fly the American uh, space shuttle um, with, inter with such an international crew. And today it's become a reality. Times are changing. And uh, thank goodness we have space and that we can be working together and uh, we can um, receive new knowledge together. Um, and this knowledge is not necessarily only to individual uh, colleagues, but to the entire humanity. And uh, as they say in Russia, when we are together, we are invincible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Salijan. And in conclusion about this uh, decade, it's Koichi Wakatas. My name is Koichi Wakata from uh, JAXA, Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. I think my colleagues have already mentioned the important stuff, so uh, my part is really easy and short. Uh, this decade, the uh, fifth decade, I think, is the, uh, the era of the, uh, the space station utilization and also the, uh, the emerging uh, new powers of uh, uh, space program. Um, Chinese uh, launched the uh, first uh, piloted flight, conducted the uh, EVA, and also uh, from Asia, we have uh, uh, space flyers from South uh, Korea, Soyon is here, and from Malaysia. Uh, so uh, more and more countries are participating in uh, human space exploration. And uh, as Ma Mike mentioned, I uh, flew before the, uh, the space station, uh, long duration crew members were on board, so nobody was living when I flew before, and then uh, I participated as a long duration crew member a couple of years ago. So uh, it is a huge difference, and uh, one of the uh, the big uh, biggest establishment during this uh, decade in the station operation is the establishment of the six crew member operation. Uh, when Mike flew, and when I first flew, uh, when I flew uh, two years ago, uh, we only had three crew members on board the station, and during the period of uh, uh, Expedition 19 and 20, we changed the uh, the crew member size from three to six. So two years ago in May, at the end of May, we first established the six crew members. Now uh, we're trying to, we're struggling to get the 35 hours of uh, science time every week, but I can tell you uh, that, that there's a huge difference between three crew member and a six crew member for the utilization. The more the merrier, it's more fun to stay, but also we can share the uh, housekeeping tasks, trash, and uh, you know, storage uh, management. 
those are the very time-consuming thing. In order to be able to establish or do a lot of science, we need to uh, efficiently perform these tasks. And uh, six crew member stage was much better than a three crew member stage. And uh, also Mike mentioned about the analog. Uh, in Houston, uh, NASA has developed those expeditionary training uh, programs underwater, in the mountains, kayaking on the ocean and also on the Russian side, Mars 500. We, ha we have a variety of on-the-ground uh, analog mission going on. And uh, psychologically, operationally, I think, uh, low-Earth orbit operation with uh, almost zero time delay is much easier compared to 20-minute time delay. When we go to Mars, we have to you know, overcome that kind of difficulty of not being able to do a real-time communication. Communication should be probably video recorded communication or something like that, or email based. And uh, we, we can do this kind of analog operation uh, on, the, on the ground. Actually, in the ne one of the NEMO missions, the underwater mission off uh, the coast of Florida, we have conducted uh, this uh, Mars analog mission to simulate this uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes time delay for the communication. There's an effort going on to, uh, to perform that kind of a similar testing using the International Space Station. And uh, I think this will require not only the crew training, probably very little crew training, but the uh, coordination uh, between the Mission Control Center and uh, coming up with uh, different kind of uh, emergency procedures uh, to cope with that kind of time delay situation will be a big effort. So we need a lot of cooperation, uh, not only among the crew members, but also the flight controllers and uh, from uh, various uh, uh, control centers through, uh, through the world. But uh, I think uh, you, ISS can be utilized in a lot of uh, cases like this. And uh, for the future, I think we should focus on this uh, analog mission so that we can utilize the station asset to go to go back to the moon to to mars and also asteroid there's a telescope that will probably go into uh, l2 lagrange point and we if, if we can establish operationally efficient method uh, to cope with this kind of time delay we may be able to send a, a hubble type repair mission like uh, jeff hoffman went to repair the hubble we may be able to send the humans to l2 to fix the uh, james Webb telescope for example and uh, since you are the specialist of the uh, medical field, um, at the end I would like to uh, emphasize that something that uh, we would like you to uh, focus, uh, to think about. As Mike mentioned, uh, um, some of the uh, medical issues that we encounter, radiation, bone loss, and uh, pepaledema that they're losing the eyesight. Bone loss uh, situation, I think, is uh, very promising because uh, we have wonderful exercise device on board the space station, uh, resistive exercise device uh, especially. And also we have medication uh, to uh, countermeasure uh, the uh, bone loss, bone density loss. So uh, I think we are uh, getting much better in that. But uh, pepaledema, uh, this losing eyesight, uh, this is some concern, a big concern among the crew members. and. Uh, I really like to see improvement in this uh, field. And also uh, to avoid the bone loss and also potential uh, reason for the uh, uh, pepaledema, this low diet uh, meal or the space food development is, is underway. I really like the Japanese food and I brought up 28 Japanese food, which was very popular among all the crew members, <laughs> Russians, Americans, Europeans, <laughs> but it's so salty. So uh, it's, uh, it's not so good for the uh, bone loss. Uh, we need to come up with a better, better way. And also the exercise device on board the station is really good, but they are so huge. When we go to, uh, to Mars or Lagrange Point or somewhere else, we need to have a more uh, a small, uh, concise exercise device. This is something that we'll like you to, to, uh, to think about for a future application. And uh, this uh, decade also is an uh, emerging era of uh, commercial space flight. We had several crew members, uh, uh, several uh, space tourists, uh, uh, thanks to the Russian participation, and also uh, Spaceship One uh, has done the uh, test flights, and uh, we will have more uh, commercial flyers. And uh, we need to come up with uh, some standardized uh, emergency, medical emergency uh, protocol or training, including the uh, commercial flyers. In Japan, we had a really big earthquake a couple months ago. I was there last week uh, to talk to the kids, but uh, it was so devastating in that area. Space medicine provides uh, s uh, application to cope with that kind of situation, like telemedicine technologies and also psychological support. 
And in addition to this conventional uh, outcome of uh, space medicine, like a protein crystal growth-based uh, 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 medicine development, there are so many areas in, in your field that will benefit the, uh, the life on, on Earth. Many countries are suffering from this problem of uh, budget problems, especially in Japan after this big earthquake. Uh, we need to maintain this space budget, and so we are trying, struggling so hard to, to find something that will benefit the uh, life on Earth. And uh, you are the specialist uh, where you can, who, who, who can come up with this kind of application. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude my, my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Koichi. Thank you, all the participants. We have 10 minutes left. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, Dr. Inessa Kozlovskaya was right when she said we don't speak enough of the MIR uh, program which served as a preliminary uh, foundation and a space field, the space range for the International Space Station when the re record du flight duration was established for people, one of them, Vladimir Tsitov. And so maybe, Inessa, you can, be, you can briefly mention um, uh, something about that. Also, I wanted to say a few words. Um, in no, conclusion, um, I think that uh, today uh, it was excellent survey on uh, history and uh, on development and progress in space, and uh, I think that one th uh, the the uh, area or the interval of long term station it turned out that it was not properly presented because it was presented. I will tell you, I just counted like. We uh, we had he, uh, heard about uh, eight uh, presentation about shuttle, and one presentation about space station. I mean Russian space station, which lasted from 70, which I I accomplished from 61 to 70. So from 70 to 95, 25 years when the uh, when states became extremely successful in shuttle and everything what was said today about shuttle was great and proper and uh, and uh, uh, even we who who were working uh, on parallel we didn't know many of things which were told in very short presentation today but at the very same time there was the parallel work of Russian people on long term, the long term stations. And these stations were the very first, I would say, scientific lab, real scientific lab uh, in space. And not just scientific, by, but international. Because right from the Salute 7, Salute 8, and Mir station, we had very broad program. And uh, when you talk today, I don't you talk about the number and statistic. But you know, I have the number uh, in my time, in my uh, base of uh, d d database. I have numbers close to 40 uh, on short duration flight because we had very nicely uh, made program for a lo long term mission when we had visiting crew which came regularly from all over the world for just for seven, ten days. That was one side, but the other side was long-term uh, space uh, uh, flight and long-term um, visiting uh, and working together crews. Because during, mm, from 81 to 95 on Mir station, we had excellent program with, with, Fran with France. Uh, which made a lot in, sci in science, especially in science of posture, locomotion, and so on. Now, uh, we had excellent program with Austrian, which lasted for many years and which gave a lot of knowledges about neuroscience. Now, we had excellent, absolutely excellent program with our American friends, which was going from 92 to the end of the uh, of the mirror, we had seven 
uh, uh, seven American people who were uh, flying and uh, who, 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 who were flying and doing life, uh, sharing life and work with uh, Russian crew members, and were doing a lot of joint work. Here, I am completely agree with Michael. I think that uh, we have to learn a lot from those uh, days of joint work which were done, I think we have to analyze it and to make from there a lot of, to take from there a lot of lessons. Why I'm saying so? Because today, like, I am working in space sciences for 33 years. And I will tell you that I worked with all over the world scientists. And I worked with American scientists starting from 92. And I will tell you, 92 or 91. So what I would like to say that on, like on Mir Station, we almost came to real international space station. Everything was developed. Everything was ready. We flew, and we don't cooperate anymore. Our, our member of a crew member do cooperate very closely, very nicely. And this is great lesson because it all, uh, already takes, uh, takes out uh, our, um, uh, that we were afraid of international incompatibility and so on and so on. No, excellent compatibility and they, they do very well. But we do not very well. Our I just insist on that that cooperate, research cooperation, scientific cooperation on the board goes not properly. And I think both of our agency, I know, Russian agency and American a agency, NASA, both of our agencies are not happy with us. They say that we did not so much as we could. And I agree with them completely. I think it is the only time when I agree with our agency. So uh, uh, I, I think that, uh, just to finish, that the experience of long-term uh, um, stations and their experience should be analyzed, and many things from there, I would not talk, uh, go in, in it, you know, uh, longer, because it's not time, but it, it should be done. Otherwise, we really uh, fly station, and we don't use it as we need. Thank you. Спасибо, Инесса, за прекрасное добавление. Thank you, Inessa, for a wonderful addition. If uh, there is anyone who desires to um, make a presentation, although we are running out of time, this theme of forecasting is going to be probed in the future. I am proposing to complete this discussion, and um, after having been reinforced, uh, to continue after lunch, if um, or unless uh, there are any urgent uh, uh, presentations or comments, I, I'd rather not sum up, but I would like to read certain aphorisms that I have extracted from certain presentations. And if nobody else wants to volunteer, I'm going to say this. Um, uh, so, in conclusion, I would like to say uh, our historic panel, that is a beautiful panel, and I was very excited about um, uh, moderating it. I tried to moderate the process. So this is what I have written down um, out of several presentations. And I think that those um, quotes are a reflection of the discussion, or maybe they will cause some criticism. Uh, I can't say them as summarizing, but they're interesting. So over the five decades, one can make the following conclusion. First, aviation medicine is the mother of space medicine. Second, the entire progress of space medicine is a ladder upwards, which was uh, achieved uh, on the basis of, or was on the shoulders of international cooperation. Third, everything was done from scratch at early 
um, periods. Uh, we learned rather from somebody else's mistakes than from our own. And after um, Europeans were and Canadians and Japanese were added to the cooperation, um, it became more orderly and it's become more interesting for long live standards on the one hand and confidentiality on the other. Fifth, the physicians in space, the more the better. Six, human behavior in space is un unpredictable but controllable. Seven, senators in space, tourists, have nothing to do without science in space. Uh, political issues are more complex than medical and biological problems in space. And this is a pre-launch uh, something. Yeah. We need the rehabilitation on the ground. And scotch in low doses is useful in any quantities. Bon appétit. Thank you.